alcohol and night swimming. It's a winning combination. <laughs> Welcome to Trimming the Movie Fat, the podcast where we trim films from franchises that don't belong. I'm Stephen Nicholson. And I'm Paul Nicholson. And we're going to need a bigger boat as we take on Killer Sharks, a classic, dated 3D, and the film that bought Michael Caine a swimming pool. It's the four movies in the Jaws series. Which movies will survive the harpooning? Jaws? Yeah. Jaws for the Revenge? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say no. Anyway, keep listening to find out. We'll also share some Jaws movie facts, provide an overview of each movie, and share our thoughts on each. So, Paul, uh, other than things being poked around in front of the camera to make use of 3D and Jaws 3, do you have a, a favourite scene from the, the four movies? Probably the famous line, you know, we're going to need a bigger boat. That's quite uh, iconic from the first movie. And I'm sure, did you not get me the T-shirt? Yes. Yeah, Amity Island, and yeah. yeah. So probably for me, yeah, that that iconic line. Because when you say that to people, most people who like their movies know that right away. That's Jaws. Uh, yeah, so I'd probably either that or the line where he goes, "You son of a bitch," and he he kills Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know the the scene where we're, we're going to need a bigger boat? Uh, Spielberg had to re-edit that before the, the film was released because in test audiences the, they were screaming that much because obviously the shark just reared its head and Bro- Chief Brody seen it uh, and because there was that much noise they then missed the line which is one of the most iconic lines in history so Spielberg actually uh, extended it, paced it out more so obviously the, the, the noise could subside and then you get to hear the line so I did not know that until today when I was doing a bit of research. Uh, yeah, so my favourite scene, I think, from the four movies is from the original one. Uh, and that is when you've got Quint, Hooper and Brody on the orca at night as they're obviously out trying to hunt Jaws. And they're sitting there just regaling stories to each other and showing their battle scars. And that's when you get uh, Quint's speech about the USS Indianapolis uh, yeah and that's just a, a really nice well acted well written scene uh, in amongst all the, the noise and carnage of the, the shark hunt so that's really good um, so um, have you got a movie fact you can share tonight Paul obviously this wasn't Steven, this wasn't Steven Spielberg's first film but this was his first this was what they started to call the blockbuster film series, like big blockbusters. So this film was the first, and then you had, after that, Star Wars, A New Hope, I suppose Close Encounters. So so this, this kind of set the trend where the cinema, this film set the trend for when the cinema became a massive phenomenon and changed it forever, actually, this film. Jaws in terms of it took uh, cinema to a new level where everything got bigger and bigger and this was the film that kind of kicked off kicked off that trend that still we have today I'll give you one uh, did you know that the horse's head in The Godfather was a real horse's head yeah uh, so there we go and I've got a Jaws fact for you uh, that the film won three Academy Awards including one for John Williams's iconic score um, and the film itself was nominated for the best picture that year yeah when they were when they were making the film Steven Spielberg found it really hard to film out at sea 
And actually, I don't know exactly what it is, but Jaws is maybe only in it for a little bit because it was so hard to film at sea. So you don't really see Jaws much. And, and like a lot of, because it is a thriller in a sense as well, that the scariest ones are the ones that you're anticipating happening, not the actual, it's 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 the music and building up and John Williams' amazing soundtrack. And the, the theme, that's what's scarier than actual seeing Jaws because it looks quite fake. But it's 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 what it builds up inside to, to your imagination. So that's why I, another fact, yeah, that it was really hard to film, and that's why the mechanics didn't work a lot of the time for the shark. So that's why Jaws actually isn't in it much, although you see the fin quite a bit, but you don't actually really see coming out. It wasn't just a film, it was a monster. Jaws. All teeth and adrenaline, Jaws tapped into something primal. The film scared me to death. scary. But making the movie was scarier still. There was a catastrophe going on. Battling through production disasters. I had never experienced anything like this before. We thought we were going to be there for the rest of our lives. To take adventure filmmaking to the edge and beyond. Stephen was fired every day. When I thought, oh my God, what have I done? This is Jaws. Jaws is an American natural horror film series that started with the 1975 film that expanded into three sequels a theme park ride, and other tie-in merchandise based on a 1974 novel. The main subject of the saga is a great white shark and its attacks on people in specific areas of the United States and the Bahamas. The original film was based on a novel written by Peter Benchley. And as Paul says, the, the first film was regarded as a watershed film in motion picture history. Um, and it's widely known for the introduction of John Williams' famous theme music. Dum, 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 dum. So the success of Jaws led to three sequels, and the four films together have earned nearly 800 million US dollars worldwide in box office gross. Although the first film was popular with critics when it was originally released, critical and commercial reception went downhill with each sequel. The reception has spread to the merchandise, with video games seen as poor imitations of the original concept. Nevertheless, the original 1975 film has generally been regarded as one of the greatest films ever and frequently appears in the top 100 of various American Film Institute rankings. It's been years since anyone has seen a shark in the seaside community of Amity Island. And visitors still flock to see the places where Jaws attacked. My name is John and I'll be your skipper today as we visit the actual spots. We're back in 1974. That bad old shark Jaws devoured those poor and innocent islanders. Very scary stuff. But on this 4th of July in Amity Harbor... Uh, uh, Terror lies around every corner. Shark! The biggest one I've ever seen! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! He's going underneath our boat! Grace! Help! What are we doing out here? Come on! Universal Creative and NBC Universal are proud to present Jaws the Ride. Attacking every day. Only at Universal Orlando Resort, where you can ride the movies and see the stars. So, one of the, the things that I was reminded of, Paul, as 
uh, I was researching this is that there there was the the Jaws ride at Universal, uh, which I think closed in twenty twelve. Did you? And and I, I believe they had it. Now, why do I think they had that at uh, Euro Disney? Why do I think that? Um, but anyway, have you you ever been on it? No, um, when we went to Disneyland Paris, it would have been the year before that closed at Orlando, but I don't remember it being being there. Uh, yeah, because we would have remembered that. The closest we got, well, I got to it was, remember we went to Jersey and they had like, a, not an aquarium, but it was like about sea animals and stuff. And at the end, when you're walking, this sort of Jaws thing jumps out. I don't know how we... Don't know how to describe it, but it was almost like this thing just jumps out and you almost have a heart attack. <laughs> so that was probably the closest I got to like a George ride. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Uh, I, I was lucky enough because <clears throat> I went to um, Orlando in 2001 and went to Universal. So I did get to go on the the, the George ride and it was great. And I think the, the the two things that I remember most from it were. Yeah, obviously the shark comes out of the water, uh, but also when there's explosions going off, I just remember them being really very, very hot. But uh, yeah, it was a shame that it closed, even though I believe it was still a very, very popular ride. Yeah, I, w- I wonder why. Yeah. A- apparently, it was an expensive ride because of the the kind of fuel or the gas they were using to create the explosion. Mm-hmm. So I think it might well have been a cost cutting type thing. Uh, because that was uh, costing money, so it was a shame. Because yeah, it was it was good. And the Back to the Future rides another one that no longer, no longer there, and that was another iconic. I mean, I'd never been on it, but I always wanted to. Yeah, no, um, that was that that was a really good ride. Yeah, I've, I've been fortunate enough to get to go on that as well. And I think the another one I think might be going is ET, uh, which is good fun as well. So. Ah, that's progress, isn't it? But uh, I think you just always count yourself lucky if you you did get the opportunity to to go on any of these rides, which are no longer longer around. What we are dealing with here is a perfect engine, an eating machine. <laughs> A great white shark. A stake to claim in the waters off Amity Island. You yell barracuda. Everybody says, huh? What? You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. This shark, swallow you whole. Whoever have one do this before? I don't know. You're going to need a bigger boat. What did, what did you do with your non-working shark problem? Did, did, did the sharks mechanical specialist have to rebuild the thing constantly? It, well, the first mistake with the shark was they made a big mistake and they built it for fresh water. Now, they all knew we were going to the Atlantic Ocean, but for some reason they built it for fresh water. What's the difference? Well, electrolysis is a major problem when you get salt into all the machinery, into, into oh, the, the electrical sure. system. And uh, so they tested the shark for the first time in the water, and we had at least 20 boats of tourists who had gathered around an area to watch the shark work. And we had the shark on a huge 90-foot platform 30 feet underwater, and at the press of a hydraulic button and pulling a lever back, supposedly the shark comes shooting out of the water head first. And this has absolutely happened because David Brown and Dick Zanuck were there watching with me. The shark came up tail first. <laughs> it just came up tail first, and it was like it, 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 it was like a 25-foot moon. <laughs> and all of the all of the tourists out there uh, essentially, you know, went back. I guess we read Peter mm-hmm. Bedersley's book in hopes that the book would be more exciting than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but that the was the first test uh, of the shark. It was it was a total disaster. We never fixed the shark, but in the cutting room, I was able to use so little of it and apply so much more that uh, when the, you finally do see the shark, it's a little bit lethargic, and that's where it was, where the story demanded that I show more than just the dorsal fin. That was the last few minutes of the movie. 
I once asked Spielberg to name his favorite private moment in Jaws, and he said it was the scene you're about to see, in which Roy Scheider, the police chief, swears at having to dish out some scraps for the shark. Mm -hmm. We laugh at that, and then we see something that stops our laughter. You're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> Great line. That was the first time we see the Jaws in Jaws, and it's a full hour into the movie, and that's one of the secrets of Spielberg, that he was wise enough not to show us his monster right away, as was done with the subsequent Jaws pictures that he did not direct. And what he liked about that scene was, you hear we bleeped out what Roy Scheider says, but he said he would sit in the back of an audience, mm -hmm. and he would wait for that moment because the audience would laugh when they heard the obscenity, mm -hmm. and then scream and so he turned a laugh he said he enjoyed turning a laugh into a scream mm -hmm. and when you know that about him then you can tell that spielberg obviously enjoys manipulating his audience i like the idea mm -hmm. of him sitting back there waiting for that moment guiding and directing the audience and it's true when you are in a spielberg film there is a sense that someone else is in control of your mind and your eyes he is not just content to throw random pictures at us he wants to run us and run us ragged and we certainly experience that in jaws the film that made him a star director there's no doubt in my mind that Steven Spielberg makes just about the best pictures of anybody for seeing with an audience. I remember seeing Jaws in 1975 yeah. with about 1,200 uh, people in Chicago. The audience would levitate simultaneously, mm -hmm. 1,200 people, and then they would come down laughing, laughing with relief in a way because there was fear and the reason that they were scared and so forth. This is interesting, the way that he does what Hitchcock used to say yes. that he liked to do, play the audience like a piano. So, Quinn's been on the radio, and he says it's time to talk about each movie. When a young woman is killed by a shark while skinny dipping near the New England tourist town of Amity Island, Police Chief Martin Brody, played by Roy Schneider, wants to close the beaches. But Mayor Larry Vaughan, played by Murray Hamilton, overrules him, fearing that the loss of tourist revenue will cripple the town. Itchiologist Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfus, and grizzled ship captain Quint, played by Robert Shaw, offer to help Brody capture the killer beast and the trio engage in an epic battle of man versus nature. So, across all of its releases, Jaws has grossed 472 million US dollars worldwide, and adjusted for inflation, it has earned almost 2 billion dollars at 2011 prices. It was not only the highest grossing movie of 1975, it was also the highest grossing movie of all time. Um, which at the time beat The Godfather uh, uh, and it held the record for a couple of years until the 1977 release of Star Wars A New Hope. On Rotten Tomatoes, the film has a 98% fresh score. On the, the critic meta score on IMDb, it is 87 out of 100. The audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 90% rating, and on the IMDb audience rating, it has a 8.0 rating there. So very, very, very high scores across the board. In summary, it's compelling, well-crafted storytelling, and it has a judicious sense of terror, ensuring Steven Spielberg Jaws has remained a benchmark in the art of delivering modern Blockbuster frills. So, what's your thoughts on the the original classic movie, Paul? And, and do you remember when and where you you seen it? It's hard to remember when and where. I think it's an excellent movie, absolutely brilliant. Uh, maybe saw it on TV or VHS. I might have actually maybe even seen the second one first. I'm not too sure, but it's just a classic classic film and it signified the start of the blockbuster films and great actors in it as well and the chemistry between uh, Quint Hooper and Brody I think that's what makes the film good as well and but I still can't watch is when they're like the local council or whatever I don't know what the term is in America but they're they're wanting like they're, they're refusing to pay money to anyone to kind of sort the problem out and then is it Hooper or Quint goes and puts their thing yeah down the blackboard oh I can't watch that and that to be honest that scared me more than the actual Jaws and that was like but just great great acting and also there's so many stories about the making of it as well that that Richard Dreyfuss and Robert Shaw never got on during it 
But I think I, I saw something a few years ago where Richard Dreyfus met Robert Shaw's granddaughter or something, and apparently she passed on information that she heard that that actually Robert Shaw really admired Richard Dreyfus and stuff. Uh, so yeah, there's so many so many fascinating things behind the making of the film. But I also think like Robert Shaw was. He was maybe the best thing in the film, I would say, actually, Robert Shaw. He was just uh, brilliant. And, of course, I think he maybe only died maybe a few years after this. But I know because his character kind of plays someone who's drinking all the time, and I think that was one of the reasons, one of his problems in life, actually, as well, in real life. So I wonder how much of that was real when he was. Was he acting or was some of it real if he was drinking? Uh, but, no, great. The benchmark for all films, really, and the music, you can't get much better than that. And I think it has captures everything because it also has like the family, and it has like there's a family feel to it as well, but there's also a sinister feel to it. And Amity Island, despite obviously Jaws and stuff, it just looks like such a place you'd want to visit. And uh, I don't know any day as a kid that didn't watch Jaws, and as soon as they went. To, had a bath or went to the swim at their local swimming pool. They didn't look underneath to check Jaws wasn't. <laughs> I think, you know, at the time, everybody probably did that, having seen Jaws. So it made a massive impact on people. Yeah, it's an absolute classic movie. And as you say, uh, how many thousands or millions of people has it put off swimming in the sea? Uh, I know I'm, I'm one of them. I'll swim in the sea, but you're always wary <laughs> of what you can't see. And that's the genius of the movie in a lot of ways, just that that, that concept. Um, but yeah, I first saw it on TV back in the 80s, and like you, I might well have seen the second one before the first one. And I think back then, the first and second were very interchangeable for me. So, But yeah, I found it exciting, scary, still do. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to see it at the cinema when it was re-released. I think they did a new 4K print of it. I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that. But uh, I did go and see it. And I think me and my wife, Alison, were about the only ones in the screening. There was maybe two other people. So pretty much had it to ourselves. But yeah, great to see it on the big screen. But yeah, you've got so many people involved in this movie that are at the top of their their game. And the, I suppose the person to start with is the director, Steven Spielberg. So, you know, who's an absolute genius. This was his calling card to the the world. Uh, I think the tension he builds in this movie by not actually showing the shark uh, is is unbelievable. Um, and the That's fin- so scary. It is, because you can't see it. The fin above the water is the, the shark. Oh, it's um, iconic, isn't it? It is. That fin above the water, that's the threat. That's the horror. That's, that's the scarier. death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't see what's underneath. Uh, so yeah, I think he masterfully directs the action, but also the quieter moments, like the the evening uh, scene on the orca when they're comparing their scars, uh, and other things like when Brody's son at the dinner tables imitating him. Yeah, remember it's that? Touching that. Yeah, it is. So the the so I think the action's balanced out by these quieter moments as well. Um, and I think, yeah, considering this was the first major motion picture that was shot at sea, um, it, it did experience a very troubled production and it went over time and budget. Um, and Steven Spielberg was still a relatively new director. So, I mean, it's just really a miracle what he and his crew pulled off um, in making this a classic. Uh, I think also uh, you have to give kudos to... Uh, Peter Benchley, who wrote the 1974 novel, which this movie is based on, because it just it, it just plays to the core fear that danger from something more powerful than you, which you can't see, that is inhuman and has no morality or remorse. So that's frightening. Uh, and um, another uh, a person who deserves a lot of praise for this and got an Oscar for it is John Williams. Uh, brilliant soundtrack um, and the, that main Jaws theme dum, 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 is one of the most recognisable uh, in the world. 
Uh, I think the the casting they did was great. So it's great uh, casting across the whole movie. But those core three leads, uh, Roy Schneider, Richard Dreyfuss, and Robert Shaw, are just pitch perfect um, in the movie. Uh, I think the stuff with them on the orca, the tensions, the frustrations, and the bonding, uh, it's just great. To yeah, there's walk. a real brotherhood about them as well, like that bit you were talking about where they are looking at all their battle scars. There's a real sort of brotherhood there, you know, a real connection with the three of them. Because they're all very different, but, but, but when they're together like that, they work really well together. Yeah, I think there's a begrudging respect for each other uh, on it. But, I mean, the film's just full of classic scenes and moments. I think the opening scene where the character of Chrissy Watkins is dragged across the, the sea when she's skinny dipping, dragged across the, the sea uh, by the shark and killed. I think the busy beach scene, which is another classic where Alex uh, Kinter is killed. Now we see the shark come up and the, he's, um, the lilo that he's on, the yellow lilo, and you see blood. And then you have that brilliant dolly zoom shot done by Spielberg uh, that he does in Roy Schneider, uh, which, you know, uh, which is legendary. I think then Mrs. Uh, Kittner slapping Chief Brody. Uh, I think she's just come from the funeral of her son. Yeah, that's sad, that bit, yeah. Uh, now, do you know she's actually in the fourth one? Sure. Yeah, she's one of the ladies after the, you know, when the oldest Brody son arrives back on Amity Island and the mum's staring at the sea outside and she's got some friends around who are, are inside the house. She's one of them. Right, okay. <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, but yeah, that, that that's uh, powerful stuff. Uh, I think the bit when they cut the, sh- the wrong shark open and the contents of its stomach comes out and you think oh what we're we going to see here uh, i think what the maybe the biggest jump scare in the movie ben gardner's body popping into view from out of his boat the damaged boat yeah uh and i think the the famous story with that one is spielberg wanted to make it even more scary so he actually i think it was three thousand dollars and i think he used his own money and filmed it in somebody's swimming pool to make it even more scary and it, it's time and money well spent. I think the guy being attacked in the lagoon, and we see his severed, head, uh, severed leg floating down. Uh, as you've mentioned already, Quint scratching his nails down the blackboard at the town meeting. Uh, all of the orca stuff, including the sinking when uh, Quint's uh, getting eaten up. That's all. Just you can see the blood coming out of his mouth. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. And even just little moments like when I think it's uh, Hooper is uh, wandering down the side of the orca to get to, I think, the front, and his foot slips. Just a little thing, you're like, oh, you're like, oh. <laughs> so it's just a brilliant movie. Uh, I love it. So uh, with each movie, Paul, we need to make a decision whether we think it's a, a prime cut or uh, awful. What si- I think we're, well, I think we're both in agreement that this is an absolute prime cut and deserves to be part of the Jaws franchise. Definitely. Definitely. It is a prime cut. Jaws 2. The terror continues. In all the vast and unknown depths of the ocean, how could there have been only one? Are you serious? Roy Scheider. I hope you're going to die. The whole beach looks incredible. Lorraine Gary. <laughs> and Murray Hamilton. Look at this. That's a shark. You started a panic on a public beach. Now what if somebody decides to sue us? That's a shark. Did you ever stop to think about that? And I know what a shark looks like because I've seen one up close. And you better do something about this one because I don't intend to go through that hell again. Don't press it this time. Mike is out there. None of men 
man's fantasies of evil can compare with the reality of Jaws. I remember in Jaws 2, specifically this one day, they set us up on this raft, they tied it down. We're all out there. They took the barge and they, they, they drove away with it and they were doing an approach shot. I guess it was supposed to be Brody seeing us at a distance and we're waving him down, maybe it was for the helicopter or something. Well, they get way off to the horizon because they really wanted to have it a nice long uh, track shot. So we're sitting there waiting to shoot and all of a sudden we see a dorsal fin. And there was the real thing. We were being circled by a hammerhead shark. I remember it clear as day. That sucker must have been at least 15 feet long. And so the shot called for us going, hey, there's a shark. We're like, you know, freaking out and everything. What they didn't realize is that we were really scared. And we, you know, that raft was not the most stable thing that we were on. And we were really freaking out. And so we're selling, we're, we're shouting to them, there's a shark, there's a shark. We've got to get out of the water. You need to put us on the barge. They're going, great, keep doing it just like that. So here we are shooting the film and we're scared to death, you know? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're shooting the movie, a shark is a shark. Well, Jaws 2, the third top moneymaker of 1978, for me was just a cheap imitation of the original Jaws. Still, it turned out to be incredibly the most successful sequel of all time. It had the same story as the original, the same island, the same stupid mayor, <laughs> the same police chief, the same script. I guess people love to see that shark eat other people, and Jaws 2 definitely had more attack scenes than the original. Maybe that's why it was such a big hit. Lots of teeth, lots of screams. I thought it was a sloppy film, but apparently it worked for one simple reason. The Jaws shark has become a classic movie villain that ranks with Frankenstein's monster and Dracula. Apparently, people will always pay to see a great white shark picture now, especially if it's released in the summertime when people are thinking about going back and doing some swimming. I agree with you, Gene. It was pure trash, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. Now, the original picture had a lot of suspense. In this one, the shark comes on, starts eating teenagers, and that's it. Now, sometimes I don't like teenagers so much myself, but that's going too far. Mm -hmm. Years after the shark attacks, it left Amity Island drilling. Sheriff Martin Brody, Roy Snyder, finds new trouble lurking in the waters. Mayor Vaughan wants to rid the beach town of the stain on its reputation. But the disappearance of a pair of divers suggests that all is not right. When Sheriff Brody voices his warnings about holding a sailing competition, everyone thinks it's post-traumatic stress. That is, until a shark fin cuts through the water. So this movie grossed uh, nearly 209 million US dollars worldwide. It was, at that point, the highest grossing sequel in history until, I think it was Rocky II in 1979 beat it. Um, it was the seventh highest grossing movie in the US and Canada in 1978. Uh, the overall winner that year was Superman. The film has a 61% Rotten Tomatoes score and 51 out of 100 critic meta score on IMDb. The audience score on Rotten Tomatoes is a disappointing 38% and the audience rating on IMDb is 5.8 out of 10. So obviously quite steep drops compared to the original Jaws. And as a summary, Jaws 2 never approaches the lingering thrills of its classic predecessor but it's reasonably entertaining for a sequel that has no reason to exist. So Jaws 2, Paul, what do you think of it? And when did you first see it? I was just going to say, I was really surprised with the IMDb rating, only giving it five, and f just under six out of ten. Mm -hmm. It's much better. I think it's a good, I think it's a really good film. So do I. And I probably, it probably took me a while to distinguish the difference between the first two because we saw them quite a lot and probably enjoyed them equally at the time. But yeah, watching them now, I, I think Jaws 2 is a really good film, but it's not the first. It is quite similar to the Die Hard franchise in that the first film is a classic. The second film is good. But as the first film stands on out, out, out on its own as a, as a bona fide classic, and I think it's the same for Jaws. 
but, but I, I, I like the second one. I think it's good. And there's something about still having Brody as the main character as well. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the next two, he's not, not in it. Uh, but no, I, I, I like uh, I like Jaws 2. And it's not as good, but it was going to be impossible to, to better the first one. And obviously, you see his family growing up a bit. And uh, I quite like the ending as well, the, the electric shock thing and stuff. I thought that was quite good. So I think it was a good sequel, but nowhere near as good as the original. Yeah, I like the the tagline for this. It's actually one of the most famous taglines on the poster in history, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. So if you're ever at a quiz night, that's actually a very popular question. What movie is this the tagline for? And of course, everybody goes Jaws. And it's like, no, it's Jaws 2. Don't get caught out, people. Uh, But yeah, I I agree. I think this movie is treated unfairly. And it's kind of tossed in with 3 and 4 for disdain. And it doesn't deserve that. I think it's a very entertaining movie. Yes, as you say, it's not at the level of Jaws, but there's lots to enjoy, not least the the returning cast and it still being on Amity uh, Amity Island. So I think, uh, well, I don't think, I know I watched this for the first time on TV in the 80s. uh, And researching it, I know it was another troubled production um, it was the uh, the first director for the film, uh, John D. Hancock, was sacked, I think, about a month into filming. Uh, I think the studio felt he was unsuitable for an action film, and he was replaced by Genos uh, Schwark, Schwark, I think that is. And, which was a shame for John Hancock, because I think he'd been working on it with his wife for about 18 months and only got into four weeks of filming. Um, and also, uh, Roy Schneider, uh, Chief Brody, uh, he didn't want to do it, and he only reprised his role uh, to end the contractual issue with Universal. Um, yeah, so he, and I think at the time, he was actually going to be starring in The Deer Hunter, uh, Michael, in The Deer Hunter, but I think there was uh, creative differences there, which freed him up to then do this. But yeah. As he was filming Jaws 2, he was unhappy during it, and he had several heated exchanges with the director, Squart, which uh, at one point ended in fisticuffs. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, lots of fun. But yeah, there's, I think as a viewer, lots to like in the film. I think it's a very breezy uh, adventure, uh, horror adventure. It feels like we're still in the same world as the first one, and a lot of sequels fail at that. This still feels one and the same with the first movie. And uh, I think having the same location, the majority of the original cast, and I think maybe crucially, composer John Williams helps. Uh, I think there's there's some inventive deaths in this. I think uh, the one that springs to mind maybe is the water skiing one and then the boat explosion. That's good stuff. Uh, I think there's some really good scares. For the, the one that again springs to mind when Brody sees the bit of uh, wood floating in the water. And he wades in to get it. And of course, as a viewer, you're thinking, oh, no, is the shark going to get him? But then when he turns the wood over, it's got the the body of the guy that was driving the boat at the beginning is stuck to that, obviously burnt onto it. Uh, so that's a really good jump scare. Um, and I think, I think the, obviously the final third of the movie is given over to the teenagers going out to, to sea. And then being, yeah, it's quite good. It is. It's great. I think it's 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 great. Yeah, and being hunted by the shark. So I think that's great fun, and and actually they all play it really, really well. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of tension there, uh, and uh, another good part is the the helicopter being attacked. Who's going to try and tow the teenagers back? Then the the shark attacks the helicopter. You know, it's that whole final act very dramatic, including the final uh, confrontation at the cable station where where the shark bites through the, the electric, electric cable. I, I have to say, that still freaks me out watching that, just knowing there are things like that out there at, at sea, this little island with a power thing on it. That's now I know that's obviously was mocked up for this movie. I think it was actually a barge. It was actually floated on a barge, that whole set. But that's just weird. That that would freak me out sitting on something like that. Again, probably because of Jaws, you're thinking, "Oh, what's in the water?" Do you know who I think's really good? 
and in the original, he's a really good actor. Is the guy that plays the mayor, yes. Mayor Vaughan, yep. Harry Hamilton. He's brilliant. He's brilliant in the two films mm-hmm. because he, I think he's brilliant because he's he plays that to perfection about the guy who who and I'm sure is a, a really nice guy, but it's just right looking at the bottom line, the money and re-elected and all that kind of stuff so uh but yeah he's very good in the role so jaws 2 is it a prime cut or awful for you paul it's very good so i'll keep that that'll be kept in the franchise yes same here prime cut for me so we have jaws 1 and 2 are retained in the series will that streak continue paul what do you reckon unfortunately (laughs) It's unrealistic to expect that. <laughs> A creature alive today has survived millions of years of evolution. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine that will attack and devour anything. One terrified you like nothing you have ever experienced when it captured your imagination and tapped your fear like no movie before it. Then, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, two continued the legend and spread the fear. Next summer, nature's most terrifying creature takes on an all-new dimension in an all-new adventure. And for the first time, the terror of Jaws will not stop at the edge of the screen. Jaws 3D. The third dimension is terror. Quaid, the time has come for you to plead the fifth. Here we go. Oh, wow, so quickly. So quickly. Right. You, played. you once said uh, in an interview that cocaine was thinly disguised in the budgets of movies. Which of your movies do you think had the biggest budget in that area? <laughs> <laughs> that would have to be... Um, <laughs> Uh, was it a trilogy? I think it was a trilogy that, or something that I was doing back in the 80s. Uh, uh, probably Jaws 3D. Probably Jaws 3D. Personally. Really? That, yeah, that Just a blowout. Yes. Yes. It was, a blowout. Yes. Had to get that shark some way. Yes, exactly. So. A blizzard. Yes. If you watch that movie now, could you tell? In the, you were, Could you tell? Yeah, every frame. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, we're going to focus on six of the worst. And Roger begins with one of his least favorites, Jaws 3D. Well, our first thinker was about a man-eating shark, and this one eats up audiences and spits them out. Jaws 3D was the third movie to star a great white shark, and the second one to make the shark boring. In Steven Spielberg's very first Jaws, a good movie made ten years ago, the shark seemed real, and so did its victims. We cared about them. We were worried about what was going to happen to them. But look at this ridiculous scene in which a phony shark chases some water skiers who are amazingly slow to catch on. Gee, that's amazing. That shark tail looks amazingly like an artificial shark tail <laughs> that's being pulled through the water at a constant rate of speed that's very unrealistic. And I think that's exactly what it was, too. Jaws 3D was, of course, in 3D. And so were a lot of movies this year. In mm. fact, 1983 saw a rebirth of the 3D fever, which was big in the 1950s, and then mercifully disappeared for 20 years before resurfacing in a series of murky, unfocused, boring, technically hapless movies yeah. that had the audience desperately struggling to see what was on the screen. I paid five dollars. What is it that you're trying to show me? <laughs> yeah. The only consolation was with movies like Jaws 3D, if you couldn't see the screen, at least you weren't missing anything. <laughs> That's absolutely true. You know, you do put on those glasses and you do feel like a kid again and you really do have fabulous expectations uh, when it is a sequel, when it is 3D. We got a couple of them on the show. and. Boy, this one really let me down. The big moment when the shark is going to crash through this little mm-hmm. sequarium, you know, the, the 3D didn't work well. Mm-hmm. It never leapt, it never came off the screen. Mm-hmm. It just hit that thing and then they cut to another scene. <laughs> Too bad. Okay, let's turn our attention to Jaws 3D from 1983. So after a young great white shark finds its way into a sea theme park managed by Calvin Bouchard, played by uh, Louis Gossett Jr., workers try to capture it. 
but the facility's attempts to keep the shark in captivity has dire consequences. A much larger mother shark appears in search of its offspring. Among those who must battle the angry aquatic killing machine are marine biologist Catherine Morgan, uh, played by Bess Armstrong, her co-worker Mike Brody, Dennis Quaid, and a pair of friendly dolphins. So the gross for this movie worldwide was 88 million US dollars, so quite significantly down on that of Jaws 1 and 2. It was only the 15th highest grossing movie of 1983. Uh, the box office champ that year was unsurprisingly Star Wars Return of the Jedi. The movie only has an 11% critics Rotten Tomatoes score. Uh, on IMDb, the critic meta score is 27 out of 100. The Rotten Tomatoes audience score is 17%. And the audience score on IMDb is a low 3.7. And as summary, a cheese-soaked ocean thriller with no evident reason to exist, Jaws 3 bellows forth with a plaintive yet ultimately unheeded cry to put this franchise out of viewers' misery. So, Jaws 3, Paul, give us your thoughts and when you first seen it. So... I think I saw it, probably saw it the first time either on video or on TV. I do remember when it came out in the cinema because I remember it was 3D. I remember a lot of people were going to the cinema to see it at the time. Uh, but I think maybe we saw it on video. And I, I quite liked it at the time. You know, I thought it was good, but it missed, you know, you didn't have John Williams, you didn't have Brody, you know, the, the whole. Yeah, because for me, Brody was like the big hero and he wasn't in the third one. It was very different and pro- uh, it was maybe one of Dennis Quaid's first films, maybe. And it's not till years later when I watched it again. <laughs> like I was telling you, I got a DVD box set maybe 15 years ago and it was all the, the, the Jaws films. And when you watch it again, it is really poor. <laughs> and uh, the acting's not the best. Although there's a few famous people in it, you have like uh, Marty McFly's mum in Back to the Future, which was two years later. Leah Thompson. Leah Thompson, she's one of the people that gets eaten by Jaws. And... Oh, no, she's not eaten. She's attacked. Attacked. She survives, yeah. Uh, The film didn't, though. But, uh, (laughs) yeah, it's the bit where the aquarium, (laughs) it just looks so false. When you're younger and you're a kid, you don't really notice that, but it just looks looks pretty terrible and the special effects of Jaws look worse than... And even though this was like eight years since the first one and obviously technology had moved on, it actually looks more dated than the first two. And, and in quite a lot of the shots, they're speeded up. It's like somebody's just got their fast-forward on the video and fast-forwarded up Jaws because it's like... You see, the, you see Jaws, and it's like going much faster. It's like it's obviously, it's so obvious. It's like somebody's put uh, fast motion on it, and it just looks so false. But it's funny watching it again. Like people of the time, I and mean, there was a the, the, uh, an English actor in it who who was in Dynasty, knew from Dynasty, and there was a guy in it, Cockney guy, who was in the Bill TV show here. So yeah, the acting wasn't particularly great in it, uh, but I did like where it was set and stuff. I did like that, like the exterior and stuff, but yeah, just a, a pure a pure film. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, well, at first, uh, like you've seen it on, uh, it was either TV or a rented video back in the 80s, and over the years, um, I've bought the likes of Jaws and Jaws 2 either on video or DVD or Blu-ray or digitally. Uh, funnily enough, I've never purchased three and four, so this is the first time I've seen this since probably the late eighties, and I, I just it's just a bit of a bit boring uh, as a movie. However, it's great fun to watch as a bad movie. Uh, so for, in that respect, I really really enjoyed rewatching it. Uh, but yeah, if we're, if we're looking at it as a proper movie. I've just seen it all before. It's like the severed head popping into view. 
divers being attacked, water skiers being attacked, the shark being destroyed by something explosive that's lodged in its mouth. So it's just very much in that respect, it's just more of the same, but with the 3D gimmick, which I'll come back to. So this time it was directed by Joe Alves. And this is the only film he ever directed after uh, producing Jaws 2. Can't imagine why he never got more work. Uh, Casting-wise, as you see, yeah, you've got uh, Harrison Ford Light, which is a young Dennis Quaid. And the thing that I liked about his performance is he just kept jumping into water, fully clothed. Rewatch it and watch how many times he's got his clothes on and keeps jumping into water, whether it's the sea or the lagoon or one of the kind of swimming training pools. Unbelievable. Yeah, and another uh, scene to watch with Dennis Quaid when he's with his uh, girlfriend in it, and they're both feeding a dolphin. And the dolphin obviously has this big, massive mouth wide open. And the two times Dennis Quaid goes to put a fish in its mouth, he misses the mouth, whereas his girlfriend gets it every time. So, yeah, I just thought that was funny watching that. The poor dolphin having to uh, adjust to try and get this fish that's fallen by the wayside. Uh, but anyway, uh, obviously Dennis Quaid plays young Michael Brody. And this is the first time I have ever noticed that the brothers in it are Chief Brody's sons from Jaws 1 and 2. Yeah, I didn't know that as well. No, I never, ever clocked that before. Um, and I have to say, when I knew that, I just thought to myself, how unlucky are they? They've had a, a killer sharks to contend with at Amity Island. Now, they both happen to be at a sea life water park in Florida when another killer shark appears. I, I, I suppose it's just like being in a passenger jet plane crash three times. What are the odds? Yeah, uh, yeah I just thought that was amusing. And you've got a young, as you mentioned already, a young Leah Thompson. Uh, uh, interesting to see her in something other than Back to the Future as Marty McFly's mum. Mm-hmm. That's quite interesting, uh, and the story. I mean, I think uh, I think you've mentioned this as well. The story. I think they they take quite an interesting angle by moving it to this water park, uh, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. Uh, and I think the the kind of water park activities, like the whale jumping, the water skiing, uh, I think that's all actually very bright and well shot uh, by the director. Um, and another nice touch in there is uh, one of the signs. For the shark that they've captured, uh, which they're now showing, uh, the sign for it outside it has got sh- sh- shark, which obviously if the original Jaws, you have the girl um, who's sh- sh- shark and pointing. So I thought that was a nice touch. Uh, but the thing that made me laugh, I think this is meant to be, was it SeaWorld in Florida? Now I've been there and I can tell you it's nowhere near the ocean. Whereas this is uh, right next to the ocean, which uh, makes me laugh as well. So, yeah, there's a real logic, a real lack of logic uh, in the story. So, for example, the main thrust of the story is that the mummy shark is trying to get back the baby shark. However, sharks have no maternal instincts, so there would be no reason why it would be seeking out its young or wanting revenge for its death. So that's a nonsense. Uh, another bit is why did they try and capture the shark in the lagoon by diving at night? Why would you do that? That makes no sense. Would you not do it in daylight where you can actually have a bit more light to see things? And the same goes with the guy that fixes the lagoon entrance gate from the sea into the lagoon. Why, 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 is, he, why is he doing that when it's getting dark? And why is he doing that on his own? Um, and also, when he goes missing... And then when they suspect he might be dead because of the shark, why does nobody call the police? It's only when they find the body, suddenly the police get called. Well, yeah, and moving on to the, the special effects, as you say, yeah, there's, there's absolutely some stinkers in here. So obviously the movie was shot in 3D, and, and you absolutely know it. <clears throat> so I think the first sign of that is the awful dated font in opening titles. Uh, and then you've got all those shots that were purely done for 3D that when you're watching it in 2D, you're just thinking, what's going on here? So I think some examples, you've got um, the lingering on a decapitated fish head that spins round for like 10 seconds or something. <clears throat> uh, a severed arm 
Uh, you've got an arrow shot straight at the camera. You've got water being squirted at the camera. Uh, <laughs> maybe the worst one, when the shark smashes through the control room window. That oh, is, yeah. That, I actually burst out laughing at that one. Yeah. And, and watched it again. That yeah. is shocking. And also when the shark explodes. Oh, yeah. It's like red paint or something. <laughs> yeah, and you've got the remnants of it after. It's awful. <laughs> so, yeah, but as a 2D viewer, you're thinking, this just looks bad. Uh, and I think to kind of continue that, uh, the terrible effect when the, the, the kind of main two characters go underwater in that yellow vehicle, uh, when they go searching for the, 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 the diver who we know is already mm-hmm. dead. Um, oh, my. It's just absolutely shocking. I think anything with the, that underwater structure as well, brutal. It's just really, really bad. Although, when the shark attacks the underwater uh, structure, that is cool. And I think when the, the mummy shark swims up to the window in the, uh, the underwater Neptune lounge, and they're sitting there and it swims up, that, that's good. That's well done. And talking of the Neptune lounge, did you notice the guy that was in there sitting on his own at the bar drinking? Looks like the most depressed man in the world. He's got a moustache. He's just sitting there looking depressed, and every time the camera cut back to him, oh, made me laugh. But anyway, let me try and finish with two positives here. Um, I, I like the part where the dolphins helped the divers escape from the shark. That was cool. And I think you had a really cool point of view shot of the English guy when he gets swallowed, and he's actually still alive in the shark's mouth, and he's trying Is that to... the Cockney guy? No. Uh... The other guy. The other guy, the more posher one. Yeah. Uh, and, and you actually see it from his point of view inside the shark's mouth. That was cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. Uh, but So yes, in summary, I really enjoyed re-watching this, but not for the reasons the filmmakers intended. So in summary, Paul, is this a prime cut or awful? No, it's a cut, but it's not a prime one. Uh, no. No, it's not. it's not good enough to be part of the franchise. No, totally unnecessary. And it seems to have been developed purely f- for 3D. You know, show 3D, which, uh, what a waste of time now. Feels a product of its time and it's not aged well. Whereas the other two, certainly the first one has aged very well. So, Jaws 3, we are cutting it from the franchise. <laughs> Instinctively, man has always been drawn to the sea. Its beauty, its mystery, its secrets. But there is also a vague uncertainty, a sense of intrusion into an alien world, where man is unwelcome and completely at the mercy of the most terrifying predator on Earth. Man's deepest fear has risen again. Jaws. The Revenge. This time, it's personal. When you bought her her first house, what was that like for you? Oh, that, that was incredible for me, for, for my mother to have a house. Because we always, we lived in, well, we grew up in council houses, you know. She was worried you couldn't afford it. What I did is, one of the worst pictures I did was a, a, a picture, I think it was called Jaws, Jaws 4. The Revenge. The Revenge, yeah. Mm. And I, I had a little part in that. And I was paid a million dollars for two weeks' work. And with that money, I bought her the house. And someone said to me, I saw that Jaws 4. He said, it stinks. I said, I haven't seen it. I said, but I've seen the house it bought my mother, and it's marvellous. <laughs> the great white shark attacks again in Jaws the Revenge, the fourth movie, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the theatre. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. That's one of four movies we'll review this week. And the question I always have is, yeah. when you see the shark at the top of the water, you only see its spin right. coming out. And yet when you get the shark's point of view, like we just Looking saw, at the people. it's like its eyes are above the water, too. That's a logical error. 
among many logical errors. You've got that That's right. Fine. We saw the same movie. I'm Gene Sisko, the Chicago Tribune. All the major players are gone from Jaws the Revenge, except Roy Scheider's wife. And her name is now just a trivia question. Ellen Brody, played by Lorraine Gary, wife of the boss of MCA Universal Pictures, which happens to make the Jaws movies. 3D failed to save the series the last time out. This time, an idiotic script sinks the whole show. The premise, Ellen Brody is a widow. Roy Scheider's character has died, meaning Scheider has enough sense to know when to stop bilking the public. And his wife in the film is convinced that a great white shark has a grudge against her family. Now, you can just hear those sharks talking. I'm going to get me a Brody if it's the last thing I do. Erp, erp, erp. <laughs> I guess that's what they very, say. Very realistic. Thank shark you. talk. There I know. Goes. That would have been more interesting than the movie. Like they say on Saturday Night Live, I hate when that happens. A dream sequence. <laughs> People were groaning in the theater when that happened. I mean, I want to go up and punch a hole in the screen. They were groaning when that happened. How about the next dream sequence? Another It's I Only a Dream. I can't stand the dream sequences. Why do they do that in the movie? If there's anything that annoys an audience, it's the dream sequence. I hate that stunt. It's old. It's cheap. It's a lousy gimmick, and I wish they would stop doing it. And then that describes a whole movie. You want to probably see what the shark looks like. They show more of it this time, and by showing more of it, actually, at the end, it sort of looks fake. As for the final confrontation, Michael Caine plays a pilot who joins Ellen Brody and one of her sons, the other's dead, and one of his friends in trying to drive the shark crazy by first making it swallow an electronic beeper box, Death by Noise. This movie is so badly made that the death of the shark isn't even set up well. There's a key shot missing so that we don't even get the whole picture. We walk out of the theater very frustrated. And that last scene is preceded by one of the most glaring errors in recent movie history. Michael Caine has been in the water, has swim to safety onto the boat, but in the very next scene, his shirt is as dry as if it had just been freshly laundered. Let's hope this is the end of the Jaws series. The first film was thrilling and well acted. The rest have been trash. It's not even the next shot. Michael Caine actually comes over the rail out of the water, right. and he's totally dry. I, I was sitting in the theater, and I said, his shirt is dry. You I know, know, the preview audience uh, Laugh. appreciated that. You know, I always hate it when people talk during the movies, but I don't know. That seemed to go over pretty well. Yeah. You know, I got a question for you. I go may ahead. be very badly confused here. In this, I, you, you know, I usually am. In this movie, yeah. this shark wants revenge against the Brody family. You got it. Yes, okay. Now, in the first movie, what happened to the shark in the first movie? Dead. Blown to pieces, right? Yeah. What happened to the shark in the second movie? I know, dead. You're yeah, right. Uh -huh. What happened to the shark in they the third movie? They all die. They all die. So in that case, Their family. what shark is this? A friend of the other shark. Is this like a cousin, a nephew? You got it. A next door neighbor? And you know what's so great? What? You see, by having this gimmick, that means that even though this one dies, she still was going to stay living in that stupid town instead of moving to the Middle West where she should be, away <laughs> from sharks. So in any event, all sharks have a revenge against the You got family. it. Right, okay, I got that. So let's move on to the final movie, which is uh, Jaws 4, Jaws the Revenge, from 1987. So the family of widow Ellen Brody, played by Lorraine Gary, has long been plagued by shark attacks. And this unfortunate association continues when her son is the victim of a massive great white. In morning, Ellen goes to visit her other son, Michael, played by Lance Guest, in the Bahamas, where she meets the charming Hoagie Newcomb played by Michael Caine. As Ellen and Hoagie begin a relationship, a huge shark appears off the coast of the island, and Ellen's troubles with the Great Whites begin again. So the gross for this movie worldwide was 52 million US dollars. So again, another uh, steep drop in the gross. Uh, it was the 54th highest grossing movie of 1987, just behind, ironically, Steven Spielberg's Empire of the Sun. Um, the Rotten Tomatoes critic score is zero <laughs> percent. <laughs> um, uh, the IMDb critic meta score fifteen out of a hundred. The Rotten Tomatoes audience score is fifteen percent, and the IMDb audience rating is three point zero. So that's uh, not that far below Jaws three. So in summary, a logical, tension-free, and filled with cut-rate special effects, Jaws the Revenge is a sorry chapter in a once-proud franchise. Do you agree with that, Paul, and when did you first see the movie? Yeah, it's a very poor film. Uh, we first saw it. Was this one of 15? I'm trying to think. I can't remember. Because we didn't... 
we saw it a couple of years later when it, we hired it on video uh, with Brian, remember? Mm-hmm. I do, yeah. And maybe Malcolm. Watched, uh, watched that, Brian's. Yeah, I just remember. And interestingly enough, they don't have, I don't know if they wanted to, at the time, uh, not have it to do with anything to do with part three, so they, they didn't call it Jaws 4. They they didn't want it to be seen as part of part three. And it was known as Jaws of Revenge, but uh, just a, a terrible film, really. It's so unrealistic. Uh, I mean, it's a good location. It looks nice on the screen, but it's just pretty awful. I mean, Michael Caine, obviously a great actor, and like, like we're saying, you know, that, you know, when people ask him about his recollection of the film, he just says it paid for my swimming pool. So, I mean, that kind of says it all, really, uh, when one of your main actors <laughs> gives you that response. But it's just not a great... It's just ridiculous, and the acting is a bit hammy as well, and one step too far, and you probably didn't think you could get any load in the third one, but they managed it. Yeah. You know, what are your thoughts on Jaws of Revenge? Where <laughs> do we start? So... Yeah, uh, so as you say, we, we rented the video, watched it at, at Brian's back in the day. And yeah, no suspense, no scares, no logic. However, um, it was nice to be back on Amity Island. Uh, so yeah, the obviously in this one, the, the Brody brothers are recast, so Michael and Sean. And this is where we get a bit of a, a lack of logic here. So we're, we're meant to believe after part three. So we're meant to believe after young Sean. Well, is he heading up the Amity Island police or is he just a deputy? Do we, do we ever find out? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. He seems very young mm. to be in that position. But anyway, but anyway, in the last movie, uh, in the last film, Sean was terrified of water after the events of Jaws 1 and 2. So he'd moved to Colorado to be well away from the sea. So after another shark attack in part three when he's visiting his brother, he's now decided to move back to the island of Amity to do a job that involves the sea. Makes sense. Yeah, so he's probably playing the odds three shark attacks in my life that ain't going to be a fourth. But whoops, he didn't think a shark could set a boy trap for him. Big mistake. So after Sean dies, his mum believes a shark has a personal vendetta against her family. Naturally, it feels strange saying that out loud. Uh, and just like the shark, we're meant to swallow that plot point. And it's the main thrust of the film, and it's absolutely absurd on every rational level. And even the tagline, the tagline for the movie, this time it's personal. To what? A shark? Why? Mm. The Chief Brody kill his brothers? And even if he did, mm. sharks don't work like that. So it's a stupid conceit from which the film can't uh, recover. It's like you're building your film on sand there. Now, apparently, uh, when I was researching this, uh, I found out that in the, the original script and novelization, that a witch puts a curse on the Brody family, which explains mm. why the shark's gone after them. But again, that's still mm. stupid, isn't it? <laughs> right? That's you know, still stupid. And and obviously that part was excised from the movie, which makes it more nonsensical. Mm. And obviously in this one as well, uh, Michael from part three, uh, Michael Brody's play, who was played by Dennis Quaid in part three, he's now had plastic surgery to change his appearance. He's changed partners, got married and become a father. <laughs> I don't know, he's obviously recast here. In a space of four years. Yeah. <laughs> so after I watched, uh, I watched this again, uh, I found that apparently part three isn't canon anymore. So they'd, they'd literally be written it out of history. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, with the, bit, uh, the bit that made me laugh is I think uh, Michael says, you know, there's never been a great white where we live in the Bahamas. It's warm water. It's like, yeah, things are going to change, Michael. Q psychic psycho sh- uh, jaws traveling over 1000 miles to track Mike and his mum in the Bahamas. Yeah, because you know that's what sharks do. Uh, try to think, I'm trying to think of some positives. Uh, one of the positives, uh, the print of this, I, I watched these digitally on Apple. The print of four was far better than three, and Michael Caine is in it. And I think Michael Caine T- brings a touch of class to, to anything that he's in. 
Uh, and as you said, we know his fee for the movie paid for his swimming pool, so well done for him. But there's just too many negatives. Uh, Mario Van Peebles' character. Uh, the dreadlocks. So Mario Van Peebles is an American actor, and he's doing a, a, a Bahamas accent in it, and his character and accent is just so annoying. Um, has he actually been in a good film? Because he, uh, he not terrible in Highlander 3 as he well? He starred in a lot of dross, yeah. Now, I was delighted when he died at the end of this movie. And then, then you find out he survived, uh, which is which is actually the movie's funniest moment. Uh, I was killing myself laughing, right? So he's been grabbed by a shark, chomped by it, and dragged deep, un- deep underwater, but he survives. Mm. That, uh, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, you see them at the end, like, they're surprised. Yeah. And, um, and the, the other thing that doesn't help the movie is it keeps showing us clips from the first film, which just only reminds you about how much better the first movie is compared to this. Uh, and another bit, that, another bit that had me laughing was the, the end, when they're obviously fighting the shark, uh, and after the the shark's gone, it, that that whole end sequence, you've got a very obvious painted horizon background. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, uh, uh, so you you basically had shots that are very obviously filmed in different locations. So you had the studio tank with the painted backdrop. You had the Bahamas location mm-hmm. shooting. You had the real life shark footage, and you had the FX shark footage. Now. If this was an exciting and engaging film, you pr- probably wouldn't be looking out for these things, but it's not, so you're like, oh, look at that. But yeah, that was funny. Whenever whenever it cut to that painted uh, that painted backdrop, I'm going, oh, it was terrible. Uh, but yeah, lo- uh, again, a lack of logic. Another few things that jumped out at me, that, which all relate to the final, the final act. So why does Mummy Brody take the boat out to sea? What is she hoping to achieve by that? So she jumps on a boat and sets off to sea. Why? Yeah. Did she think she was going to die uh, if she'd done that and the curse would be lifted? Or was she going to fight the shark? Or what's her, her motive? That's never explained. Uh, and to follow on from that, you've got Michael Caine's character with uh, Mike Brody and Mario Van Peebles' character going out on the plane. To try and track down Mummy Brody, so the finder. I think the radio her position in. So, what would be the next logical thing to do? Would you think you know what the sharks following her? We can see it. What we should do is crash land the plane in the ocean. Hope we survive that. Uh, let's hope we survive it. Then we'll climb out and then we'll swim the distance over to the boat. And hopefully we'll make it over there in time before the shark eats us. It just doesn't make any sense. And then the last part, when the shark dies, how does the shark die? Do you, do you know how the shark dies? Because it's it's, it's like the... the... Oh, oh, yeah, because they put... The, yeah, is it not like... It's supposed to be like the end of the first one? No. You son of a bitch. Oh, no, mm. but it's like they're obviously using that electrical thing to annoy it, but I don't think that was going to kill it. Mm-hmm. But then the boat that they're on seems to go into the shark and the, the you know, the bit at the front, the bowsprit, it seems to go into the shark. But that's not going to make it explode. I just don't, that, no, I, I'm just thinking, why is the, sh- why is the shark exploded? But of course, they put in the Brody, the, like you're saying, the flashback, they put that in. But you wouldn't do that at the key point in the film, putting a flashback for the key point in the film. There's a, a severe lack of logic in this. But um but yes, this was a I, I loved watching this. This was a terrific bad movie to watch. <laughs> this is the kind of movie you put on with your friends, a few beers, get some pizza and watch it and just have a, a laugh. It's a terrifically bad movie. Guilty pleasure. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, right, Paul. Uh, does this survive? Uh, do we do we drown it, or do we uh, do we take it back to shore and save it? Is it a prime cut or awful? I think Jaws has taken us away to obscurity. <laughs> yes, I think we need to cut it from the franchise. So we lose Jaws: The Revenge. So, in summary, Paul, what we're saying is that what stays afloat. 
is Jaws 1 and 2, and we're letting Jaws 3 and Jaws the Revenge sink without a trace. Yes. Um, so if you were ranking it, uh, the movies, Paul, I'm guessing you'll be the same as me. It would just be in order of release, yeah, in, in terms of favourite to least yeah, favourite? Yeah. yeah, in terms of just the, the order they were made. But each film gradually quality decreases. <laughs> mm. Would yeah. would you like them to do another Jaws movie? Or do you think they should just let it, let it, let it go now? I mean, they, they have done like a few sort of imitations, haven't they? Like uh, Meg. No, nothing's come close to Jaws, though. No. I think possibly, yeah. I think technology, what it is now. But I think what made Jaws so good was the, the cast as mm. well. Particularly the first yeah. one. Amazing cast. Uh, so even if you've got the technology, if you've not got the best actors. But I, I wouldn't be against a reboot. Hmm, I don't know, because it's it's one of these things where they're just chasing the shark tail, so to speak, and will they make anything as good as the first one? Highly un- unlikely, and you know, with the Die Hard series recently, and it's just progressively get worse with each one, because you're, you're, you're basically still trying to attain the greatness of the, the original uh, with diminishing returns, so I don't know, sometimes you just think uh, let things lie and move on and do something original and new. So, but like you, yeah, if they, if they were said, right, we're gonna bring in some top quality talent and we're gonna do something really dramatic and you know serious, uh, then yeah, maybe why not? Actually, do you know it's it's the kind of thing that could make a a good kind of mini TV show on the likes of Netflix or Amazon. That that I think that would be. Rather than a movie, that would perhaps be a better fit. Uh, so that that could that, you could introduce it to a new generation. Mm-hmm. That could be yeah. just to do something different with it. Uh, that could be mm-hmm. that could be quite uh, yeah quite quite good to see. So we'll see. But I don't I don't know if they have like if the, if that is possible to ever do if like Steven Spielberg I don't know obviously somebody did the book but I, I don't know if like Steven Spielberg owns the rights or the story now or because I know like Back to the Future. There's a deal, Robert Zemeckis and the people that it could never be remade. Yeah, different scenario uh, here in that uh, I think they they own the rights because uh, it was their story, whereas uh, Spielberg doesn't own uh, owns the rights to that. No, it's Universal, so um, it could it could be done. Yeah, it could be done. So our boat has sunk, but we're going to use the debris to safely float home. So agree or disagree with what we've said, you can join our Facebook group and interact with us there. Remember to subscribe to the podcast so you are advised when a new episode is dropped and we're looking to to do uh, at least one episode each month. And the next one is going to be on the Bourne, the Jason Bourne. Well, it's not... I suppose it's not... Specifically, Jason Bourne, because there is one movie which doesn't have a minute, so we'll call it the Bourne franchise. So we're going to be look, taking a look at uh, those five movies in our next podcast episode. So it's time for us to quint while we're ahead. Thanks for listening, and keep on trimming. <laughs>